Hey everyone, welcome to Mythology Explained. In today's video, we are going to discuss Satan, whether or not he's trapped in hell. First, we are going to see how Satan, where he currently resides, is portrayed in fiction, looking at Dante's Inferno and then at Paradise Lost. Second, we are going to see what scripture has to say about where Satan is. And third, we are going to delve into various interpretations of scripture, here meaning the eschatological perspectives used to understand the Bible, these different perspectives yielding different answers, roaming the earth, locked away in the hearts of sinners, or imprisoned forever in hell. Alright, let's get into it. In Dante Alighieri's Inferno, the ninth circle of hell, the deepest, most desolate, and most despair-filled circle, is reserved for traitors, treachery deemed the most egregious of sins, and those who perpetrate it the most wicked of sinners. The sanctity of special relationships defiled by the betrayals of these transgressors. The ninth circle is a vast frozen lake named Cocytus, and it is divided into four concentric rings. The ice becomes progressively thicker and more torturous as one moves inward to the circle's center. The rings house different types of traitors, those who betrayed their kin, those who betrayed their countries, those who betrayed their guests, and those who betrayed their benefactors. At the center of Cocytus, Satan is imprisoned in ice up to his waist, continuously chewing on Judas Iscariot, Brutus, and Cassius, the three greatest traitors in Dante's view. Judas betrayed Jesus, and Brutus and Cassius betrayed Julius Caesar. Satan is described as a monstrous giant with three heads and a great pair of bat's wings. Judas is perpetually devoured by the center head, Brutus and Cassius by the two outside ones. Though Satan participates in the punishment of, per the reckoning of Dante, the three most evil sinners in all of history, he himself is also condemned, torturously trapped in a state of physical and spiritual agony. One of the details that communicates this are the tears that incessantly stream from his six weeping eyes. In John Milton's Paradise Lost, the narrative begins with Satan and the angels who followed him, the other inimical insurgents, already in hell, having been cast out of heaven following their failed rebellion against God. Satan rouses them, suggesting they can still defy God. They build a palace called Pandemonium, where they hold a council to decide their next steps. Satan volunteers to corrupt God's new creation, mankind. Journeying from hell, he encounters sin and death at the gates, both of whom allow him passage. Reaching the newly created earth, Satan spies Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He observes them and learns of their one prohibition, not to eat from the tree of knowledge. Taking the form of a serpent, he successfully tempts Eve to eat the fruit, and she, in turn, tempts Adam. This disobedience causes the fall of man. Having succeeded in seducing the seed of humanity to sin, Satan returns to hell, believing himself triumphant, an exultant notion he would soon be disabused of. Once again, he and the other demons congregated, this time gathered to be regaled by the corrupting conquest of their leader. However, unbeknownst to Satan and the demonic horde, God actually allowed sin and death to enter the world because they would both be later vanquished by the sacrifice of the Son, by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. After expounding and extolling the tale of his triumphs, Satan wasn't met with applause and adulation, but with the writhing of coils and the hissing of snakes, into which Satan and his baleful brethren were all transformed. This sudden transformation was not only a poetic punishment, but also an apt representation of their own deceitful nature. Far from the mighty, defiant beings they perceived themselves to be, they were now reduced to creatures slithering on their bellies, reminding them of their fall from grace. The kingdom of hell, once roaring with defiant pride, now echoed with the lamentations of fallen angels, reduced to a teeming tangle of serpents, all wriggle and squirm. They were forever cursed, not to be serpents for all time, for they would regain their previous forms, but to forever exist as forlorn outcasts, perpetually and irrevocably beyond the light and love of God. In the grand scheme of divine providence, their momentary victory in Eden was but a small blip, setting the stage for the ultimate redemption of mankind 
and the definitive defeat of evil. Now that we've seen how Satan's whereabouts are depicted in two of the most seminal and celebrated additions to the Western canon, Satan torturously trapped in Dante's Inferno, and Satan seemingly allowed to come and go from hell as he pleases, though forever sundered from God and paradise lost, we are now going to go over what scripture has to say about Satan, specifically about his modern day state and location, and over what the various interpretations of said scripture are, tumbling down the rabbit hole, so to speak, of eschatology. The book of Revelation, the final book of the New Testament, is an apocalyptic text, the writing of which is attributed to the Apostle John. It presents a series of visions and prophecies, vividly depicting a cosmic conflict between good and evil, the legions of the light and the divisions of the dark, each headed, respectively, by God and Satan. The culmination of all the war and wrath entailed in the book of Revelation is the final judgment, the time when all souls will be judged, either rewarded with eternal life in paradise or condemned to the lake of fire, an unimaginably terrible fate marked by unending anguish and affliction and by utter and eternal separation from God. Pertaining to Satan, the book of Revelation sees him rebel against God and subsequently expelled from heaven, sees him banished to earth where he unleashes his dark power upon the mortal world and covers the land in darkness, sees him defeated again, this second defeat resulting in a 1,000 year imprisonment in the bottomless pit, and sees him, upon his release, prey on the spiritual weaknesses of humanity, exploiting its susceptibility to sin and marshal the malevolent forces of the world yet again. This time though, suffering a swift and permanent defeat, Satan condemned to the lake of fire, which is to say condemned to hell. Based on what's written in Revelation, Satan is either in heaven rebelling, on earth stirring up sinister plots and spreading sin, imprisoned in the bottomless pit, or condemned to hell. Said succinctly, either in heaven, on earth, in the bottomless pit, or in hell. However, because the book of Revelation is a prophetic work, there are many interpretations. On an institutional level, it means different things to different denominations, and on an individual level, means different things to different people. Because of this, answering whether or not Satan is trapped in hell is contingent on how the book of Revelation is interpreted, which takes us into the realm of eschatology. Eschatology, in a general sense, refers to the study of last things or the ultimate destiny of humanity and the universe. It encompasses beliefs and theories about the end of the world, final judgment, the afterlife, and the ultimate fate of individual souls. The study delves into concepts such as life's cyclical nature, transformational and transcendental events, and notions of continuity and finality. Pertaining to Christianity, there is an array of eschatological perspectives that are used to interpret the book of Revelation. Different perspectives are espoused by different Christian denominations, meaning there can be significant differences in what the Bible is taken to mean. To clarify, here are a couple of general examples. If it was thought that everything in the book of Revelation had already come to pass, then right now, Satan would be in hell, already thrown into the lake of fire. However, if it was thought that the events told of in the book of Revelation were still ongoing, then right now, Satan would be somewhere else, perhaps on earth, perhaps in the bottomless pit. From here, we are going to run through a miscellany of eschatological perspectives to see where Satan is. We'll begin with millennialism, which focuses on the 1000 year imprisonment of Satan in the bottomless pit. And following that, we'll cover a couple more perspectives. Millennialism is a category within Christian eschatology that pertains to beliefs about a prophesied thousand-year period connected with Christ's reign, as described in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. This category encompasses the binding of Satan, the reign of Christ, and the eventual fates of the righteous and wicked. Here's the passage from the book of Revelation that tells of the binding of Satan and the thousand-year reign of Jesus. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, 
so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Under the umbrella of millennialism, there are three primary perspectives, premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism. Premillennialists believe Christ will return before this thousand year period. Postmillennialists believe that Christ will return after a thousand year era of Christian triumph. And amillennialists see the millennium as symbolic, with Christ's reign being spiritual and already in progress since his resurrection. Of the three substrates of millennialism, we will now only cover premillennialism and amillennialism before moving on to other eschatological perspectives. Postmillennialism, you see, lost a lot of momentum in the 20th century. Events like World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, nuclear weapons, and the oppressive possibility of global annihilation, and the rise of various totalitarian regimes, such as Maoist China and the Stalin-led Soviet Union, called into question the notion of a thousand-year era of Christian triumph. People were disturbed and, you could say, disillusioned and consequently, adherence drastically waned. Today, while not completely defunct, the tumult and turmoil of the last hundred years severely eroded its popularity. Premillennialism posits that Christ will physically return to earth before inaugurating a literal thousand-year period, millennium, of peace and righteousness. According to this view, the current age is marked by increasing evil and decay culminating in a great tribulation and the appearance of the Antichrist. After this tribulation, Christ will return, defeat the forces of evil, and bind Satan, establishing his millennial kingdom. During this time, the resurrected saints will reign with him, while the remaining will experience a peaceful, restored earth. At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released for a final rebellion, which will be quashed, followed by the last judgment and the making of a new heaven and earth. Premillennialists generally believe that Satan is currently active on earth, working to deceive humanity and oppose God's purpose. They believe that this current age, prior to the return of Christ, is characterized by increasing moral decay, deception, and the influence of evil. This perspective holds that Satan will continue to exert his influence, leading up to a period known as the Great Tribulation, during which the Antichrist, under Satan's influence or direction, will rise to power. It is only with Christ's return, as per premillennialist beliefs, that Satan will be bound for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. After this period, Satan is released for a brief time for a final rebellion before being defeated once and for all. Amillennialism, on the other hand, takes a more symbolic approach. It holds that the binding of Satan and the reign of Jesus is more figurative than literal. Rather than Satan being bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and Jesus reigning on earth for a thousand years, amillennialists believe the thousand year period to be a period of unknown length and believe the binding of Satan and the reign of Jesus, again, rather than a literal binding and a literal reign, to be symbolic. Symbolic of the current age of the church and of the power of Jesus. Amillennialism maintains that the thousand-year period began when Jesus was resurrected, after he sacrificed himself on the cross, maintains that we are currently in this thousand-year period, maintains that the reign of Christ exists through redemption and the spread of the gospel, and maintains that Satan, while he is still active in the world, able to exert some measure of his former strength, has largely been defanged, his power radically curtailed by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus meaning that while Satan can still cause problems today, he doesn't have the power to deceive nations, overpower the church, and cover all the land in his wickedness. The eschatological perspective of amillennialism goes at least as far back as the 4th century AD, to the time of St. Augustine of Hippo, one of the most influential theologians and philosophers in the history of Christianity. The City of God, one of his most important works, was written in the early 5th century AD. It was penned in response to the sack of Rome by the Visigoths. The sack shocked the Roman world and led many to question the power of Christianity. Augustine sought to defend the Christian faith against the accusations that it was responsible for Rome's downfall. 
The work is divided into 22 books and covers a wide range of topics. The second part, books 11 to 22, is, by comparison to the first part, a more constructive effort, laying out Augustine's vision of history and the ultimate destinies of human beings. He introduces the concepts of the two cities, the city of God and the city of man. The city of God is made up of those who love God and aim for eternal life, while the city of man consists of those who love earthly things and are rooted in temporal pursuits. Temporal meaning within the span of a human life as opposed to the eternal of the spiritual. Augustine uses biblical history to trace the development and ultimate fates of these two cities. Book 20 focuses on the final judgment, and within it is dedicated a few chapters to the millennium, the binding of Satan, and the reign of Jesus. According to Augustine, the bottomless pit, rather than being a literal abyss, is the totality of the hearts of the sinful. Before the binding, Satan was free to contend with the church, deceive nations, and prey on the righteous who carried God in their hearts. But after his binding, only the sinful, those who were unrepentant and rejected God, were susceptible to Satan's wickedness. Being constrained as such, Satan's power was both radically diminished and, in a more minor way, greatly amplified. Diminished because the flock of the righteous was now beyond his power, and amplified because his power over the sinful was given new strength. Here's the passage that explains this. And he cast him into the abyss, i.e. cast the devil into the abyss. By the abyss is meant the countless multitude of the wicked whose hearts are unfathomably deep in malignity against the church of God. Not that the devil was not there before, but he is said to be cast in thither, because, when prevented from harming believers, he takes more complete possession of the ungodly. What's more, Satan's binding is said to become more powerful over time, as loss of power commensurate with the spread of Christianity. Each person converted is one less person he can corrupt. Each person, figuratively speaking, an additional link in the chain that holds Satan fast. As well, Satan's binding is said to be indissoluble. Yes, he's imprisoned in the hearts of sinners, and these sinners, being mortal, will die. But with them Satan's prison, the bottomless pit, will not die. For just as people die every day, so too are people born every day. Satan's prison is a living prison, replenished by the hearts of the newly born, who grow to be God-scorning rather than God-fearing. Here's the passage that explains this. Now the devil was thus bound, not only when the church began to be more and more widely extended among the nations beyond Judea, but is now and shall be bound till the end of the world, when he is to be loosed. Because even now men are, and doubtless to the end of the world shall be, converted to the faith from the unbelief in which he held them. And this strong one is bound in each instance in which he is spoiled of one of his goods. And the abyss in which he is shut up is not at an end when those die who are alive when first he was shut up in it, but these have been succeeded, and shall to the end of the world be succeeded, by others born after them with a like hate of the Christians, and in the depth of whose blind hearts he is continually shut up as in an abyss. With millennialism covered, we will now look at two more eschatological perspectives, namely partial preterism and full preterism. Preterism is a Christian eschatological view that interprets biblical prophecies as events that have already occurred in history. Derived from the Latin term praetor, meaning past, preterism asserts that prophetic passages, often seen by other perspectives as referring to future end-time events, were instead fulfilled in the past. In essence, preterism sees scripture's predictive elements as being directly connected to and validated by historical occurrences. There are two types of preterism, partial and full. Partial preterism holds that many but not all of the prophecies in the Bible have already been fulfilled. Events like the second coming of Christ and the final judgment not yet come to pass. Partial preterism interprets the prophecies of the Bible through one of two prisms, either through the sacking of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD, or through the Roman Empire, its persecution of Christians and subsequent adoption of Christianity. An example of partial preterist interpretation 
comes in the description of Satan as having seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads of Satan, here conceived of as a red dragon, are usually interpreted as the seven hills of Rome, which was a common identifier for the city in the ancient world. Satan's ten horns are viewed as symbols of power. In the symbology of the Bible, horns frequently represent kingdoms or kings due to the horns' association with strength and might in the natural world, where animals use their horns for defense and dominance. The number 10, in biblical numerology, often symbolizes completeness or wholeness. In this context, the 10 horns could be interpreted as symbolizing the entirety of the Roman Empire's might, possibly referring to its complete geographical expanse or the full sequence of its emperors. Full preterism, sometimes pejoratively labeled as hyperpreterism by its detractors, maintains that the sacking of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD was the culmination of biblical prophecy, marking the fulfillment of every New Testament prophecy and the conclusion of everything said in Scripture. Contrasting with partial preterism, which holds that the second coming of Christ and the last judgment have yet to take place, full preterism holds that the second coming of Christ was, in a symbolic sense, manifest when the military might of Rome ravaged Jerusalem and raised the second temple in 70 AD. This is viewed as paralleling the end of the book of Revelation, which describes the end of the world and the emergence of a new earth and heaven. Here, Judaism is the old world, and the superseding era of Christianity is the new earth and heaven. In this view, Satan's period of deception, rebellion, and his subsequent defeat and punishment all took place in the past. Therefore, from the full preterist standpoint, Satan is currently in hell. And for this reason, full preterism is seen by the reckoning of Christianity in general as heterodox at best and often as heretical. And that's it for this video. If you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.